Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we began today's worship service singing a beautiful hymn, Just As I Am. God invites us to come to Him just as we are. And as we come to our Lord, we have nothing to offer except for our brokenness, our sin, our fears, our doubts. We come to our Lord poor, wretched, and blind. And we are in need of what he desires to shower upon us. We are in need of his cleansing, of his pardon, of his washing away all of our sins with the blood of Jesus Christ, with his breaking down all the barriers that separate us from a relationship with him. And as we come to him, just as we are, believing and trusting in Christ and because of the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us, he pours out on us his forgiveness and his righteousness. He gives to us life and hope. And he gives to us his holiness in order that we may live as his holy, as his special people. And none of these things are because of anything we have done. We can't earn it. We certainly don't deserve all of this. Because of our sin, we deserve God's wrath. But because of Jesus Christ, all of this, his forgiveness, his righteousness, his holiness is a free gift in Jesus Christ. That so that we as the holy people of God may worship our holy God. Do you think of yourself as holy? God does. God does. Not because of us, but because of him. And it's his gift to us. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so that you may declare the praises of him who brought you out of darkness and brought you into his wonderful light. We are called to be holy. We are called in the Lord's holiness and we are called to live a holy life. But the holiness doesn't come from us. We come to the Lord just as we are, sinners and in need of what he gives. God is the source of holiness. God is the one who showers his holiness upon us. And it, it's, it's holiness that that we can receive but we can't possess. It's a lot like the light from the sun. The sun shines on us every day and we receive that light from the sun, but it, it's not ours. It doesn't come from us. It comes from the sun. The holiness that we have is a gift that comes from our God. And our story today about King David is all about Holiness, And as we heard in our, in our scripture readings, the, the, the central thing that's being discussed and talked about in our story today is the Ark of the Covenant. And in Exodus chapter 25, our first reading, God gave specific directions to Moses exactly how the Ark of the Covenant was to be made. And as we heard in the children's message, covered with gold and, and beautiful that was how God came to his people. That's how God interacted with his people, the people that he had, had called. And the, the Ark of the Covenant was the throne of God on earth. And the Ark was placed in the holy place of the tabernacle, and that's where the people would, would gather to worship. So David, as he is reigning over all of Israel now, desires to bring the Ark of the Covenant uh, to Jerusalem, 
as, as God is going to establish Jerusalem as his holy city, as David seeks to unify the worship of God in Jerusalem. A little bit of background before we talk about David bringing the ark into Jerusalem. About 50 to 80 years before this, the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. This was before Saul became king, and the Israelites were battling against the Philistines, and they decided to take the Ark of the Covenant with them, like a good luck charm, in order to beat the Philistines. Uh, it didn't work. They were defeated, and the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant and took it to their cities, actually several cities. And the reason for that is because as it went to each city, so did plagues from God to the point where nobody wanted it anymore. And they finally said, how do we get rid of this thing? And so they put it on a cart drawn by oxen and sent it back to the Israelites. And then it was stored at the house of Abinadab for all of these years, until now when David is going to bring the ark to Jerusalem. And so what they do to bring the ark to Jerusalem is they place it on a new cart carried by ox, or pulled by oxen. And then there's two men who are one in front and one of the, in the back following this cart as it's being drawn. And all the people, the army of David and David and the Israelites are worshiping and praising God. There's music and they're singing. They're probably singing psalms. And it says they are worshiping the Lord with all of their might. What a joyous, wonderful celebration. Until the oxen stumble. And when the oxen stumble, Uzzah, who's following behind the cart, fears that the, the ark is going to fall off the cart, and he reaches out and grabs it. And instantly, he's killed by God. Why? Numbers chapter 4, verse 15 says, specific words from God, do not touch the holy things or you will die. God was very specific about how the ark was to be treated and about how the ark was to be transported. What they were doing was treating the ark the same way the Philistines did. Probably the only difference is they put it on a new cart. But that's not how it was to be moved. There were rings that were on the ark. There were poles that went into the rings. And the ark was to be carried. And it was carried, to be carried by Levites. The two men who were transporting the ark on a cart were Judahites. And no one ever was to touch it. David seeks to return the ark to its place of honor. And in the way he goes about doing it, he shows disrespect because he doesn't follow the regulations. And the response of David as this happens is he's angry. The Hebrew text does not indicate who David is angry at. Is he angry at God? Maybe. Ever been angry with God? But more than likely... David was probably most angry with himself. What did I do? 
Why did I take this shortcut? This was preventable. This didn't happen to happen, have to happen. And still, as we consider the story, we go, but, but why did God do this? Why? They had, David had good intentions. Uzzah had good intentions. I mean, Uzzah probably it was a quick reaction. The ark is slipping. I've got to stop it. God's holiness is absolute. He is uncompromising in his holiness. He means what he says, and he does what he says. And this is one of those stories that it shocks us. And, and maybe why it's in Scripture. It shocks us. It shocked David. David was afraid after this happened. David was afraid, am I no longer going to be king? What's going to happen next? David doesn't want to bring the ark now to Jerusalem. Instead, the ark is taken to the home of Obed-Edom. So as we hear this story, it, it brings up a question that I've heard many times, and maybe you've had this question before. Does God punish us for our sin? You know, a lot of times we, we struggle with that question. Things start going wrong in our lives, and we start thinking about the things we've done, and we go, is God punishing me for my sin? No. God does not punish us for sin. He took all of that punishment and he put it on Christ, on the cross, every bit of it. The wages of sin is death. What, what the punishment of sin is eternal damnation. And God put all of that on Christ. But then there's the second question. Does God discipline us? And the answer to that question is yes. Just read Hebrews chapter 12. That's your homework for today. I encourage you to read Hebrews chapter 12 because it's very specific about the fact that God punishes us. Or not, excuse me, disciplines us. Disciplines us as a father, as a parent, disciplines their children. My parents disciplined me. Yeah. And when my parents said, this is the way it is, that's the way it was. And if I stepped across the line, I was disciplined because of that. And the reason for that was because they loved me. They wanted to protect me. They wanted me to grow in character. And so they disciplined. Rather than saying, yeah, this is the way it is, but you can do whatever you want. It really doesn't matter. And that's the way God works with us as he disciplines us because it's not about you can do whatever you want. It really doesn't matter. And I do want to read just a portion of chapter 12 of Hebrews to you where it says in verse 9, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. 
What we see happening in our story today is God disciplining. God says this is the way it is. Don't cross the line. And what was happening is that the Israelites were drifting. David was drifting. Have you noticed recently how things have changed as we've been talking about the stories of David? You know, it started off with, you know, the, the, the young boy and picking up his stones and incredible trust in the Lord and taking down Goliath. And then last Sunday we heard the reading of David and it started with the whole list of wives that he had, a polygamist. And it started... And it talked about how he wasn't following the wisdom of God, but rather his own wisdom and the wisdom of the other nations of how to negotiate and do things politically. They were wandering. And the Lord is seeking to draw them back. Because our hearts, they're prone to wander. When it comes to God's word, often we like to take the shortcut. Well, I followed most of it. We do step across the boundaries that God sets before us. We bend the truth. And there are times when we do God's things our way. Does God discipline us? Yeah. To get our attention. To draw us back. I've certainly experienced his discipline in my life. There have been many times where he has gotten my attention. And the whole goal and the whole purpose is the Lord to draw us back, to draw us to repentance. To recognize our, own, our unholiness and that holiness only comes from Him. And our need for His forgiveness and our need for His love. David's heart was turned in this event. The ark stayed for three months at the house of Obed-Edom. And then as David saw the, the blessings that were coming to him and his family... David realized the, the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, and then David did bring the ark to Jerusalem, but this time did it exactly the way it was supposed to be done. Carried on poles by Levites, no one touching it. God's holiness is our hope. It is. Because he's so serious about his holiness and it makes him very serious about sin. And he is driven and was driven to take care of our sin that we may experience his holiness, that we may experience his grace, that we may know his love and his forgiveness in Jesus Christ and so we see on the cross of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Holy God taking upon Himself all of our unholiness, all of our sin, all of our brokenness, and paying the full price because a price needed to be paid in order for there to be holiness again. A price needed to be paid. A sacrifice needed to be paid. And God in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, did that completely and totally so that we may come to him as he invites us just as I am. Just as I am. Responding to his call. Responding to his discipline over and over again, responding to his call of repentance, responding to his call to receive his grace and his love and his forgiveness, 
to be restored as he places his holiness on us. That we may live the lives he called us to live, empowered and strengthened by him because it doesn't come from us. It comes from him. And it's his gift of righteousness, holiness, forgiveness, and love. So that we may be the people that he's called us to be and live in worship and praise to him. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and brought you in to his wonderful light. We pray. Good and gracious God, we come to you just as we are, in need of all that you give. And we are so thankful for what you have done for us. We are so thankful for the gift of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your holiness going to the cross and taking upon yourself all of our unholiness, all of our sin, paying the price for all of it. And then we thank you, dear Lord, for giving us these wonderful gifts. Help us to always take to heart who we are because of you, who you have made us, and help us to respond in a life of worship, and service to you. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.